Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers and I want to talk to you about the danger of airline GPS jamming. Now the Wall Street Journal today had a very good article about uh, just one example of how this can be an extreme problem. How the signals can be spoofed, and I'll get into more of this later, but not only does it cause an immediate threat that can be very uh, dangerous, it uh, can actually have long-lasting effects. On this one United Airlines flight, uh, the GPS never did properly update for wrong information. And we have a lot of ways to update it with ground stations and stuff. And I'll talk about that issue in a bit too. But basically it told the crew that they were landing in the ocean by the time they got done. And fortunately there's enough backup navigation systems that um, they were able to get the correct information. But that, that is also a future issue. So GPS could affect a lot of systems. It can affect the train uh, collision and avoidance system. And uh, one crew got a whoop whoop pull up. Now that can be very similar to the TCAS, uh, but that gives you a climb climb. Now it's different, but you know, you're sitting there, you've been flying for a long time and you're a little bit tired. You get a sudden startle reaction like that telling you to climb. And that can be a very dangerous situation, climbing out of your assigned altitude, possibly in the assigned altitude of somebody else. And the other thing is there's a lot of auxiliary things like messaging. If the timestamp uh, is screwed up in your aircraft because, uh, and that's one of the issues, they, they screw up the timestamp, they change the clock, uh, which affects where it thinks it is, where its position is. That can also affect messages. You don't get messages because the timestamp is screwed up. Now, who am I to be flapping my gums, you're probably asking, because anybody can come on a YouTube channel and flap their gums. That's the wonderful thing about YouTube in some respects. Okay, here's why um, I've got a little bit of background in this. I started out, I got an electrical engineering degree at the University of Iowa, and I went in and I became a pilot for the Air Force. So I spent my time in the Air Force, got out, uh, went to work for United Airlines. This is actually my final uh, flight here, my retirement flight. I uh, had 36 years. I was a line check airman. It's an instructor in that. Also on the uh, 727, the Airbus, and uh, the uh, 777 uh, for the last part. Well, I got out of the Air Force and I got furloughed, so I went to work for Boeing. And uh, I, I made a, a very significant uh, improvement to the B-52 radar. Actually, I got to uh, be lead engineer in the group. Uh, which shows right there. I was lead engineer in the microwave technology group, but basically we worked issues from DC to light, as you would say. I worked all frequencies, and this is a little letter for uh, my improvement. The improvement I made to the B-52 radar more than doubled its accuracy. In fact, it exceeded our ability to measure it initially at the time. And this is a rather complex aircraft, and the program was getting in trouble. And this was back in the early 80s. And I originally started working for Cessna flight tests and Boeing flight tests, but because I'd had a, a degree in electrical engineering and I had been working on my master's, degree while I was in the Air Force, but then because getting out to go to the airlines, I had to terminate that. So I, I was seven hours short of a dual master's in aeroelectrical engineering, which eh, I wish I would have completed, but I didn't. That's another story. Anyway, the, um, uh, the, the interesting thing about this radar is it, I figured it would be long gone. Okay, this is 2024. This was in 19, uh, early 1980s. This was uh, put on and implemented. It probably took a few years. But I found out from one of the Boeing test pilots, B-52 Boeing test pilots, that this antenna is still on the aircraft, still being used, and works very well. And it's going to be replaced with the uh, the engine modification and some other avionics. It is about time. There's been such better systems out for a long time. But anyway, I digress. That's part of the shirt here thing. Okay, I was involved in a lot of test programs out at Edwards, and I also was involved in a lot of committee work at the Airline Pilots Association, and also there's my uh, Boeing flight test card up there. And uh, I was chairman of the Alpa National New Aircraft Evaluation Certification Committee, the Aircraft uh, Performance and Evaluation uh, Committee, um, Aircraft Development and Evaluation Committee, I even forget what the names are, and uh, uh, various other things. I also was asked by the FAA to chair an international uh, committee, uh, SAE, for our data accuracy. And this was used to uh, establish certification standards for fly-by-wire aircraft to protect them from external sources. So I've got a lot of electromagnetic interference, uh, external source threat background. But most of this was just for from common emitters like radars, transmitters, and uh, things like that. This was not intentional jamming. So this, this is another issue. 
And I had an amazing group of people on my committee. These are just a few of the business cards of the people who were involved. It was a international committee. I had people from all over the world on my committee, which, which, uh, uh, that, that, there's a few interesting stories with that. But anyway, also, and for my, uh, uh paper and work on design of fly by wire aircraft flight control systems, I won the, uh, Society Experimental Test Pilots Best Technical Paper of the Year Award and an Aviation Week, uh, uh, Laurel's Award for Commercial Aviation. Okay, well, as the narcissist says, that's enough me talking about me. Now you talk about me. Now, okay, that's enough. Hopefully I've established my background is fairly decent. So here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the threat. Now, the GPS satellites, um, they orbit uh, about 13,000 miles up. Okay, that, that's a ways up there, and satellites have never had a plethora of extra power for anything, and they have to put out signals, and the signals are, uh, by design, rather weak. And it's used, we use the GPS signals both for civilian and military, and that's kind of the problem. When they're used for military, um, some people might say, we don't want you to use that GPS signal for uh, military. And what they do is they bring in this the GPS jammers. Now you can imagine you got a satellite; it's uh, relying on photocells up in space. Now the the, uh, the amount of power you get from those is intense. It's not like your ground stuff. We uh, I operated the University of Iowa. I'm digressing here. University of Iowa Engine Five satellite, and they took the satellite. Uh, they placed it outside of the physics building. They took all these arc lights and surrounded it. And they said the light was blinding. They only got 50% power. They got 100% power in space. So you can imagine how bright it is up there. And, but still, that doesn't give you the type of power you can generate by a ground station. So, okay, 13,000 miles away, 100 miles away, with a lot more power, the GPS signal is not going to get through very well. And there are all sorts of different... Uh, big, medium-sized, even portable. Of course, this is like the very first cell phones with the box. They called them portable. It's it's a little heavy, but that's portable. But they actually, uh, you can get, I guess, they're illegal. It's illegal to intentionally jam a signal. Uh, but you can get GPS and uh, cell phone uh, jammers. I actually... Um, don't, don't turn me in, but I bought one of these over in Beijing, and I, uh, I brought it into the flight office and uh, played with it. Uh, a friend of mine picked up a cell phone to make a call, and I turned it on, and pfft, it's gone. Uh, I think that's the only time I've turned it on, so uh, no, don't, don't turn me in. That is an illegal event. Okay, but here's, here's the thing. They've been talking about getting rid of the VORs. Now, the VORs is one of the things we use to update the GPS signal, um, and it's it's a ground base, and it can update the GPS signal, or at least provide error correction uh, to say, "Hey, this is where you really are." I don't know why this thing gives me a thumbs up; it must like it. But <laughs> anyway, uh, that's one of the things. And they talk about shutting these down, and they also been saying that, "Hey, this." GPS is so accurate, and it is, once they took off the dithering, if you're old enough to remember that whole thing, uh, the, the, the GPS signal is amazingly accurate, and you could use it for Cat 3 navigation. They've been talking about that. This is an ILS antenna here, um, if you're not familiar with that, um, but they've been talking about doing away with that. Well, the dangers of putting all your eggs in one basket is... Not good. And that's one of the things I've been uh, campaigning against that, you know, don't take away backup capabilities. I've always liked backup capabilities. Don't rely on just one source, especially if it's used for the military, because there could be a time. And I was thinking, you know, more of a larger engagement where they'd, they'd just wipe everything out. Of course, there's been uh, talk about space warfare where they go up and they wipe out satellites. You know, you, you take and uh, set off a nuke. Uh, it generates an EMP and it wipes out a ton of satellites. They actually, in the 50s, set off a nuclear warhead in space above Hawaii. Uh, it was kept secret for a long time. I actually knew an engineer who was involved in the process. Um, but it, it uh, caused uh, power grid problems on the surface in Hawaii. It was so strong. And it wiped out the, one of the very first communi uh, communication satellites, the Telstar satellite, if you're old enough to remember that. That was a death. This the little, little uh, experiment the military was doing over Hawaii was the death of our very first communication satellite. 
Okay, so back here. Uh, well, what do we do? Uh, the little red circle there. Uh, bullseye is where the event occurred, and it caused erroneous information for the rest of the flight. Uh, they're trying to figure out, well, what do we do? Okay, uh, they're trying to come up with fi uh, things where, well, maybe you reset circuit breakers. Um, yeah, with the new electronics equipment, sometimes that works. Um, it can be rather dangerous. The pilot has to, one pilot at least has to get out of his seat. And, you know, if there's an argument for keeping two pilots, um, this is a good one because uh, you get something like this and the workload just goes through the roof. And uh, if the one pilot has to get out of the seat to start doing circuit breakers, uh, yeah, I, I don't even want to think about that. Now, in the olden days where we just had VORs and we didn't have GPS, everything was a lot simpler. Well, more or less. I actually uh, was a member of a State Department committee that uh, went to an international conference. Ref, uh, and this was involved where the FM radio stations, which are right adjacent to the um, ILS stations, wanted to increase their power horrendously. In fact, uh, Midway uh, Airport, uh, runway 22 looks directly down at uh, the Sears Tower. That's not called that anymore. I guess, whatever, Willis Tower or whatever. It's still always going to be the Sears Tower to us Chicago people. Sears Tower to us Chicago people, not Sears. Oh, my gosh. Sears. So, anyway, it was looking right down there, and it would have taken out uh, that ILS easily if they had allowed them to go up to fifty to 100,000 watts. I was the only pilot on this International State Department Committee, which I thought was interesting. So I'm, I'm arguing that, hey, we need these systems to work where everybody else and the FCC was involved. And of course, they, they were looking at the money. They, weren't, they didn't give a damn about um, airlines. And uh, they were a lot stronger contingent than the FAA contingent because they controlled a lot more money. Well, we've come a long way, and uh, just one point of interest is I was told that I'm the only non-Boeing test pilot who's flown both of these aircraft. Uh, that 777 was in flight test. We It uh, went to United Airlines, but I flew that in flight test, and I also... Uh, had the very nice privilege uh, given to me by the director of flight operations uh, there um, that uh, at Boeing at the time, it was a different company back then, uh, that got me a flight on the Boeing 247. So I got to, to fly that. And of course, uh, back in the olden days, it's kind of interesting. I'm reading an Ernest uh, Gone, again, movie uh, book right now. And he talks about um, how uh, even going across the Atlantic, uh, there was no air traffic control. You'd just take off and went. And there were so few, you know, big sky, little airplane theory. I'm digressing. Uh, big sky, little airplane theory. People just went and they didn't run into each other. But modern cockpits are much more involved, much more sophisticated. And these systems have to be reliable. They have to have backups. So um, keep two pilots. Uh, don't get rid of the ground updating non-GPS uh, type of system and uh, we'll have a lot safer infrastructure. So that's my two cents on this whole uh, issue of the dangers of GPS jamming. I hope you found it interesting, informative. Thanks for watching.